What a good way to start 2015 is by talking about all the games that came out in 2014. Truth be told, 2014 wasn't the best year for gaming, since I didn't really have a lot of those AAA or great games that I enjoyed playing, but the games that were good in 2014 were really, really good. So good, in fact, it was incredibly hard just to settle the placement. But I hope you guys are gonna enjoy it either way, but I have to mention two important things. One, remakes and ports are out of the list, so that means Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire are out. Another thing, this is just my opinion, and it's not absolute, and everyone is gonna be different, I can guarantee that with my placement of the games of the year, you're probably gonna disagree. But instead of telling me how awful I am, why not just write in the comments what are your favorite games of the year? It can be order, not order, top 5, top 10, whatever you wanna do, it's your platform, might as well use it. So without further ado, here's Blankler Top 10 Games of 2014. Number 10 You don't know Jack! So you're seeing this game popping out on this top 10 list and you're probably thinking the only reason I put it there is because of this. Daniel Lambliano! Lambliano! But you would be wrong because I love You Don't Know Jack. In fact, more of it is always appreciated, being my favorite trivia game. But instead of just getting a new version of that, you also get four additional games as well. While some are duds, the others are classics. But what I really like about the Jackbox, it's how it integrates multiplayer into the experience. Not every person you're gonna go to their home will have four controllers lying around to give that perfect couch multiplayer. So what do you do in this situation? You get one of those guys, and I'm pretty sure most of you do. Either a phone, a computer, or a tablet. Just go to the website, put the code in, and you can enjoy an amazing multiplayer time with most of the games. Some of them even go up to eight or even a hundred. This is incredible! Despite some latency issues, this works surprisingly well. And as cheesy as it may sound, when I stream games, the best part about it is seeing the people in the chat involved. And no game I played this year had more interaction than the Jackbox. Even if some of the questions repeated here and there, the fun we had is more than a reason to put it on the list. I am Cookie Masterson, and I shaved my nipples for this, so let's hurry before it grows back. Number 9. Sometimes I just wanna hate a game, especially when it gets rave reviews over and over again, building hype to such monstrous level, and then when I finally get to play it, I think it's just okay. It happened to me before, and now it happened again with Shovel Knight. But when I play it again, I notice something really important. Shovel Knight isn't a good game for catering to our younger selves, but it's a good game because it's really well made. You can tell the people at Yacht Club Games knew how to design a platform game, not to mention each level has its own mechanics to make the experience fresh throughout. Along with a nice 8-bit aesthetics and a dose of parallax scrolling, a nice soundtrack by the cheap tune virtuoso, Jake <laughs> Bert Kaufman, Shovel Knight deserves its praises, no doubt, even if I do respect the game more than I do like it. Number 8 2014 was a pretty interesting year for shooters. In fact, the one I was looking forward to the most this year turned out to be the most disappointing. But there were some good shooters here and there, I mean, Far Cry 4, despite it being a derivative of the last game, was pretty entertaining for what it was, and I have to commend Call of Duty at once Forfer for being the best Call of Duty game in 7 years! Heck, the campaign was actually playable and fun! But the best shooter of the year is by far, and a good reason why it's on the spot of this list, Wolfenstein The New Order. And this is why. First of all, the story. Let's be honest guys, we don't need a game to give us a reason to hate Nazis. But the story takes a rather real perspective about the horrors of war. In addition, the game's protagonist, Blaskowitz, despite him being yet another meathead in a shooter game, has far more personality than his hulking counterparts since he actually shows emotion throughout the story in greeting monologues. Thanks to great writing and memorable characters, the game does far more than what an average FPS game does. Oh, yeah, right, there's gameplay here too! The game throws a lot on the players. Stealth kills, dual wielding, projectile knives, death-inducing lasers, you name it. The fact that the game excels in every single element makes it better than the sum of its parts. Lastly, 
Wolfenstein harkens to the days where FPS games didn't have the open world or be based on a current event to be popular, but just focus on simple yet memorable map design and a myriad of secrets. The game rewards players for exploring a deceptively simple game world, and the rewards are more than worth it. If you pass it by the first time, I guarantee you, the father of first-person shooters is finally back. Number 7 The biggest surprise of 2014 was easily South Park's Stick of Truth. And considering all the things that went against it, it's quite an achievement. The fact that it was in development hell because of what happened to THQ, the fact that Obsidian, even though they made a good game here and there, made some serious stinkers, and most importantly, this is a South Park game. And this is its pedigree. I reviewed what I considered to be the best of the bunch, and even that game was incredibly mediocre. But what makes this game different? To sum it up, take the gameplay of Paper Mario, the contemporary setting of Earthbound, add a lot of South Park touch, and you get one of the most unique games of the year. While the game wasn't the biggest RPG in the world, exploring the town of South Park was a dream come true to fans such as myself, not to mention the overabundance of secrets. The battle system wasn't the most complicated, but it was effective and fun throughout the whole adventure. It's unfortunate the game ends on a whimper despite all the great build-up beforehand, but it's such a minor gripe to begin with. For a game that was destined to be a failure, I think it's safe to say we can all go to South Park to have ourselves a time. To honor his efforts, he will no longer be called Douchebag. New kid, I hereby dub thee Sir Douchebag. Congratulations. Number 6 Oh boy, Mario Kart 8. Why when you play your first track, the level of polish is out of this world? The lush colors, the smooth framing, and especially the jazzy soundtrack are leagues above what the lackluster Wii version did. Oh, and the game itself? Plays like a dream, even if the anti-graph segments were an afterthought. The controls were much tighter, and even simpler things like the time lacking to lift the racer back to the track assists in delivering a faster-paced game. Items are definitely more balanced, and the track design is amazing! Aside one choice, every single track, new or old, is bound to be a new inductee to the Mario Kart Hall of Fame. Also, Mario Kart 8 gets major points for having the best DLC ever. I'm not joking, Nintendo offering various characters and amazing Nintendo tracks for a ridiculously low price of $11.99. That price will grant you 16 tracks, which is half of the amount that's already on the disc of the game itself that costs 60 bucks. That's insane. But the only knock I have against Mario Kart 8 is the Mute City track in the DLC. Not because I don't like Mute City or F-Zero, heck I love them, but even if you also put into account the fact that the game has zero gravity racing, it only shows me more signs that we're not gonna see a new F-Zero game in the future. <sighs> Thanks a lot, Shiggy. Number 5 Well, 2014 did one thing I didn't expect to happen until two years from now, but I caved in after talk to my friends and a few deals online. And lo and behold, I played Blur on an Xbox One. So the main reason why I bought the Xbox One is because some of the exclusives are pretty good, but... It's kind of funny that the best game on the system right now is made by a company that used to work for Sony. And that's none other than Insomniac's first game on the system, Sunset Overdrive. If you really want to enjoy the game, don't put too much attention to the story. The story is uneventful and the characters are bland stereotypes. But thankfully, an extremely strong performance by Yuri Lowenthal as the male lead really allows him to stretch his acting chops far more than his usual forte. The game is definitely the funniest when it's making fun of gaming cliches more than anything else. Wait, how do we communicate with Sam when neither of us is holding a phone? Uh, you know, technology. Technology. Let's not complicate things by poking holes in the way we deliver the story, okay? But even if you decide to put the voices or the music on mute, the gameplay far exceeds everything in this package. Sunset City is a giant playground where you can grind, bounce, wall run, vault from point to point while using a variety of goofy yet colorful weaponry. 
half of the game's fun is not just doing the creative story or side missions, but just getting from point A and B and racking up as many points as possible. This was a game I almost never used the fast travel option because traversing the city was so much fun. Why is this game so high on the list? Here's the thing, when I finished those other games, I wasn't sure if I would go back to play them again. I'm still playing Sunset Overdrive, that's how fun it is. Number 4 As much as I would like to make this list a happy occasion, sometimes there's gonna be a tragic tale. Such is the case with Guilty Gear Exard. The original sequel to Guilty Gear and X, Guilty Gear XX, came out in 2003, and after a bajillion expansion packs, Blaze Blues, and Persona arenas, we finally get a legitimate Guilty Gear game! And guess what? It comes out the last two weeks of 2014. In fact, game trailers review this game on January 30th, six weeks after the release of the game originally! So you know what? I'm gonna give you guys a PSA that tells you exactly why Guilty Gear Exard was one of the best games of 2014. Here's why. SNAP! Right off the bat, Guilty Gear Exard is gorgeous. While the game looks like a traditional 2D fighting game, all the character models are in 3D emulating a 2D fighter feel, which is especially breathtaking where a special overdrive move is performed and the camera moves around. The soundtrack is once again guitar-shredding metal that we know and love, and even the voice acting is pretty good, now with English voices. Special mention again for Yuri Lowenthal as Batman for cracking me up. You know the odds of a magic ship just falling from the sky for no reason? About 0.000001%, but really those odds don't mean anything, especially to you. With the amazing graphics and the fantastic soundtrack, one thing must be remembered, it's still the same old Guilty Gear we know and love. Fast, high octane action that provides new moves and tweaks to a solid fighting game franchise. Even the biggest complaint of the laggy online mode has been patched up in the last month, and the story mode, while lacking battles, was still engaging throughout. If you love fighting games or something to play with friends, Guilty Gear Xard is a must own. You can't replace Delilah. Oh, you have eyes for me? Number 3 Freaking duh okay, 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 I will actually give a reason why it's on the list Here you go The first reason is the 3DS version itself We have a portable version of Smash Bros that we can take anywhere Not to mention that Smash Run, the 3DS exclusive mode is incredibly fun much more than Smash Tour. But despite that mishap, everything else in Smash Bros. Wii U is so fun and engaging. Really, where should I even begin? The new stages, the new characters, the new modes that you can play. All in all, it all sums up with this. It's Smash Brothers. You know it's great, I know it's great, and that's why it's on the list. And who can forget? The Amiibos! You can play with them together in Smash Bros and train them so they can kick your butt because they have much better an eye than a normal computer and they're just awesome to collect! Especially if you like to balance them on your head! Actually, a better idea would just be to play with them like a normal human being. Number 2! Simply calling Shadow of Mordor just a fusion of Assassin's Creed and the Batman Arkham game is doing a huge disservice to it. Open world traversal feels far more fluid in this game compared to the misadventures of the Brotherhood, making the world itself feel contained and less bloated. Second, the combat is on par with the Batman Arkham games, and with many different upgrades to buy, it never becomes dull, especially since the enemy troops don't dwindle but populate, so we always have to be on your toes. But the nemesis system is the real hook of the game. The stories that you make by facing off various generals and warships in Mordor far surpasses the issues I had with the main narrative. Nothing like reading the mind of an unsuspecting orc, thinking that his boss is a weakness to stealth attacks, locating him from the top of a spire, and then pounce at him and finish him off with a single blow. And I will be 100% honest, I don't even like Lord of the Rings in particular. I mean, it's not bad, I just never connected to the universe. And if a guy like myself can say that, and still love a game like Shadows of Mordor, it's definitely doing one thing right. Number one! I 
admit I made a lot of past mistakes. One of those is in my top 10 most anticipated games of E3 2013. I say that those two games are gonna be top tier games, and I have no idea what was I thinking. But there was one game I was 100% sure that's gonna be a top tier. So much so that now it's my favorite game of the last year, and that is Bayonetta 2. The original Bayonetta was already one of my all time favorite games, but somehow Platinum Games even without the helm of Hideki Kamiya, who mostly wore the wonderful 101 at the time, has managed to refine the combat even more, and added the very enjoyable Umbrun Climax dish out massive damage in a variety of eye-popping ways. The weapons are abundant, the secrets are plentiful, the bosses are humongous and intimidating, the challenges are ample, and even the story is better this time around. The fact that Bayonetta doesn't suffer from amnesia anymore means we can enjoy her character growth throughout the story, as well as enjoy of all the cool side characters as well. Also, did I forget to mention one more thing? Oh yeah! This game comes bundled with Bayonetta 1, so you get both 1 and 2 for the same price. 1 and 2! Two games for the price of one, two masterful gaming experiences that everyone should try out. Granted, Bayonetta 2 doesn't stray too far away from the original's formula, but it didn't need to. It fixed what needed to be fixed, it refined what was already very polished, and delivered one of the best gaming experiences I've had not just in 2014, but in gaming overall. Bayonetta 2 is not a game that Wii U owners need to play, it's a game that everyone needs to play and is an instant must own. And it is easily my favorite game of 2014. Look at this guys, I'm actually using a normal end slate for a video. And this is all thanks to what up Nico on Twitter. Nico here actually helped me with the rebranding of the channel that's gonna go in effect in the next few months or so. Starting with, well, now. So I hope you enjoy this design as much as I do. If you want to see more of my videos, just click on any of the thumbnails, and of course support the channel, please subscribe. Thank you very much for watching, and take care! And plus, who doesn't love Amiibos? You can play with them together, they can kick your butt because they're level 50 and they know your strategies, and I'm terrible at balancing! Isn't that fun? <laughs>